Um, don't know why this. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Inclusive Education Network of CIRA and especially Diane, Lisa, and Stella for the invitation. Um, as Stella said, I'm currently working at Oslo Metropolitan University in, in Norway. And until recently, I was uh, working at uh, the University of Stirling. And it was during my employment in Scotland um, that the research I'm presenting today was carried out. Uh, the project for which I was the principal investigator was titled Promoting Equity, Inclusion and Social Justice in Scottish Mathematics Classrooms, Early Years, Primary and Secondary Teachers Perspectives. And it was funded by the Carnegie Trust for the Universities of Scotland and was supported by, by the University of Stirling. An overview of uh, how this presentation is structured. Um, first, we shall have a brief look at the international literature in order to clarify some important issues and see where this project stands in relation to, to research trends uh, and concerns beyond its specific cultural context. Uh, secondly, we're going to zoom into Scotland and discuss a little bit how the particular Scottish context informs this project. Subsequently, I'm going to say a few things about the project itself, participants and data collection. And finally, I'm presenting some of the findings that emerged from our analysis with discussion of some key ideas. Soon after, we will have uh, time for discussion, comments and questions. And I promise I would do my best to keep this presentation within uh, 25 minutes. To, to start, I'm, I'm turning our attention to the international uh, literature on who appears to be uh, doing well and who appears to be underperforming or being marginalized, if you prefer, in school mathematics. Several studies, especially from Europe and North America, inform us that there are large discrepancies between the academic performances of uh, groups of children with different demographic characteristics. Uh, these discrepancies are often called the achievement or the attainment gap. Uh, one specific group, the so-called dominant group, seems to outperform the others uh, systematically. And the demographic characteristics of this group are the white, middle-class, heterosexual boys. Now, the groups of children that appear not to be doing so well share at least one of the characteristics you, you see on this slide. They're girls, children with ethnic background other than that of the dominant group, um, LGBTQI plus children, other language learners, um, children with learning, emotional, and kinesthetic uh, difficulties from families of low socioeconomic status and so on. Simply put, mathematics classrooms around the world um, appear to be operating as spaces in favor of the white, middle-class, heteronormative male learner, while at the same time, other groups of learners are to varying degrees sent to the margins. We also know from many studies that specific educational contexts uh, adopt specific lenses through which marginalization is explored. For example, in the USA, the discussion is focused on race uh, and particularly the Black and Latinx communities. In the UK, the focus is almost exclusively on social class. Uh, in several European countries, emphasis is placed on immigrants and other language learners. In China and many Latin American countries, the focus is on rurality, while in countries like South Africa, specific interest is given to multilingualism and, and various health issues. 
Now the concept of equity um, emerges as, as a response uh, to these observed discrepancies. Uh, according to, to Rochelle Gutierrez, equity refers to the erasure of the ability to predict pupils, mathematics, achievement, and participation based solely on characteristics such as race, class, ethnicity, sex, beliefs and creeds, and proficiency in the dominant language. In, in my working uh, definition, the concept of equity um, entails five characteristics or dimensions. The, the first four come from the work of Gutierrez, access to resources available to engage with quality mathematics, achievement, and this can be measured through standardized uh, test scores and participation rates, identity, um, which has to do with maintaining cultural, um, uh, linguistic and familiar connections, and power, the agency to affect change in schools or society. Um, the fifth comes from the work of Joe Bowler, who introduces the concept of relational equity. Uh, relational equity moves beyond numbers and, and refers to the respect um, pupils learn to have for others, uh, for other circumstances, and how to support each other in the journey uh, of learning mathematics. Uh, simply put, when we want to talk about equity in school mathematics and beyond the subject, we need to look at these five dimensions these five aspects. Which teaching practices in mathematics promote equity? In, in other words, uh, which teaching practices can be seen as equitable? Here, uh, with the term equitable teaching practices, I refer to the evidence-based classroom actions employed by teachers to support all pupils learning as a response to an acknowledgement of each pupil's background. Uh, I want to emphasize the evidence-based character of such practices. Um, as we know from several studies that teachers may hold beliefs about practices they consider equitable, which in reality uh, may be contributing to the maintenance or reproduction of inequalities uh, and social exclusion. The work of Tonya Bartel and uh, her colleagues is extremely helpful in providing us with guidance as to which practices can be considered as equitable. Uh, their research team um, examined several research papers and concluded that there are nine practices that, when employed by teachers, help achieve equity in mathematics. So in, in the following slides, uh, you, you, you can see the nine practices uh, by Bartel and her colleagues uh, and a brief description of each. I won't be reading these in detail. I'm just mentioning them by name, but I will just keep the slides here for some more seconds so you can scan through. So the first is to draw on pupils' funds of knowledge. Second is to establish classroom norms for participation, position pupils as uh, capable, monitor how pupils position each other, attend explicitly to race and culture, recognize multiple forms of discourse and language as a resource, press for academic success, attend to pupils' mathematical thinking, support the development of um, a sociopolitical disposition. Now let us zoom to Scotland. As with the rest of the UK, uh, when examining attainment gaps and marginalization, or when the term equity appears in, in policy discourse, Scottish policies place explicit emphasis on social class and socioeconomic status. And this can be seen in official documents that talk about narrowing the poverty-related attainment gap for literacy and numeracy, such as 
the National Improvement Framework and Improvement Plan for Scottish Education, Scottish, the Scottish Attainment Challenge, pupil equity funding, getting it right for uh, every child and so on. Also, the, the Scottish government highlights that transitioning from one school level to another needs specific attention, especially with regard to pupils from low socioeconomic backgrounds. So I'm, I'm sure those of you from Scotland are familiar with the acronym SIND, which stands for the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. I, I, I don't know if there are people uh, out with Scotland with us today. So just briefly mentioning that um, SIMD is a relative measure of deprivation used by the Scottish government to describe each area in Scotland, taking into account seven different measures, income, employment, education, health, access to services, crime, and housing. Uh, all areas are given an integer SIMD value from one to 10. Areas with SIMDs one, two, and three are typically thought to be the most deprived, while areas with SIMDs seven and above are generally thought to be affluent. Um, each child is associated with uh, the SIMD of the area they live in, and each Scottish school receives direct additional funding based on how many children from low SIMDs are there. Um, our project uh, was funded by the University of Stirling and the Carnegie Trust for the Universities of Scotland. And the focus was on uh, Scottish teachers working in the central belt uh, of Scotland, uh, which is a large area with the highest levels of deprivation across the whole country based on the SIMTs of its sub areas. Of course, it would be oversimplified to say that every area in the central belt is deprived. Uh, in fact, if, if we take Glasgow, for example, uh, there are many areas in the city with SIMDs one, two, three, while at the same time, there are other areas with SIMDs eight to 10. Uh, participants were eight early years teachers, 11 primary and 10 secondary mathematics teachers. Um, Again, to, to clarify some things for non-Scottish people in the audience, um, the General Teaching Council of Scotland, which is the body responsible for registering um, uh, teachers, uh, officially registers people as either primary or secondary. Um, the primary teachers work with children of ages three to 11, um, however, some primary teachers self-identify as early years teachers due to their preference to teach the youngest children. Um, in, in this study, we asked um, the primary participants to tell us how they identify as early years or, or primary. And the secondary teachers are mathematics specialists for ages 12 to 18, and all teachers participated here in, in an individual semi-structured interview based on, on the experiences of teaching numeracy and mathematics. So specifically, um, our work was based on the following three uh, research questions. What are the similarities and differences in the perceptions of teachers uh, at these three school levels regarding the causes of marginalization in school mathematics? What are the similarities and differences um, of teaching practices that at these three school levels perceived as equitable by the teachers themselves? And how do teachers understand concepts like equity, inclusion, diversity, and social justice in relation to school mathematics? So today I'm presenting findings related to, to the first um, two questions. So in, in regard to our first research question, uh, perceptions of uh, marginalization, a great homogeneity was observed among the 29 participants across the three school levels. 
all teachers talked about social class um, as the main reason why some children don't perform as well as some of their peers. So on this slide, we see some actual quotes from the interviews. Um, uh, the one you see, uh, the, the orange box is from, is a quote from a, a secondary mathematics teacher who said, I suppose the attainment gap reflects the, I don't know, uh, what, what, what would you call it? The affluence gap, I don't know, monetary gap, economic gap. Uh, in my experience, they have reflected each other almost identically. And in, in the blue box, we see a quote from a primary teacher uh, saying that the school that I teach in uh, has a lot of pupils from low SINDs. Uh, most of the children are level three in the indication markup. Uh, there's, a high there's a high level of students who get free school meals, and as a result, our school gets quite a lot of funding from the National Improvement Framework. And a lot of parents are proud. Uh, they don't want to tell you that they're struggling or whatever, but you are aware that these children are not getting proper meals. So teachers' responses are, in a sense, here, unsurprising. In fact, they reflect the broader discussions on uh, achievement gap and equity uh, within the Scottish educational system. And keep, this, keep these thoughts in mind as we will be revisiting them towards the end of the presentation. Very few teachers made some scattered references to other marginalizing variables such as gender, English language competence and family dynamics beyond socioeconomic status. However, we could not observe any specific pattern uh, in, in these responses. As teachers either re, uh, referred exclusively to social class or in few cases, social class plus something else. Um, so on, on this slide, uh, we see three examples from such responses, one from each school level. Uh, a secondary uh, mathematics teacher uh, talked about gender. Uh, I feel like girls have very low uh, confidence of maths and, and they don't want to put an answer down because they don't want it to be wrong. Boys are overly confident and therefore don't study and do worse than they should do. And girls have very low self-esteem, self um, get very anxious and don't want to attend. Uh, a quote from a primary teacher here um, about children with English as an additional language. I've got children who are in that gap because they're E-A-L. They can literally do the simple one plus one, but they can do word problems. Uh, in an early years teacher who talked about parents' mental well-being, I've seen parents' anxiety and mental health be so prevalent that they want to allow their child to go to school because they can't be without them. Now, uh, moving to our next research question, teachers' perceptions of equitable practices. Just to clarify, during the interviews with the teachers, we did not ask, could you tell me what practices you think are equitable? Uh, we rather invited teachers to share examples of practices from their own um, teaching that aim uh, at addressing the needs of those children they talked about as marginalized and, and, and who can be associated with the so uh, widely used term attainment um, gap. Their responses across the three school levels reflected the debate on ability versus mixed ability grouping. Um, Several academics around the world talk about ability grouping as a form of discrimination, 
and a classroom practice that perpetuates social injustices. Yet a number of studies in the context of Scotland um, indicate that many school teachers still believe that such a practice has its place in schools. And our findings do confirm this, uh, as teachers either talked in favor of ability grouping for pragmatic reasons, or in favor of mixed ability groupings for scaffolding purposes. Uh, as I said earlier, this polarization was observed uh, across uh, early years, primary and secondary uh, participants. So apart from uh, teachers' uh, responses concerning the two types of grouping, which appear to be common across school levels, um, their, their uh, responses were more uh, homogeneous within their school level than across. Um, for example, most, uh, almost every teacher who identified as early years teacher talked about the, the practices you see on this slide, play, scaffolding, hands-on activities, and the use of concrete uh, and, and visual materials, whole class sharing and talk, and provision of outdoor learning experiences. For those participants identifying as primary teachers, the following teaching practices or strategies were discussed. Um, direct questioning, differentiation by task, uh, that is providing tasks of different degree of challenge. And, and those of you from Scotland might be familiar with terms like mild, medium, hot, or other similar labels used by, by, by teachers. Um, opportunities for children to share their um, different strategies with the whole class. In some cases, the introduction of uh, standardized testing, encouraging the, encouraging the use of uh, concrete materials and visuals and technology-aided practices. For, for the secondary mathematics uh, teachers, the reported practices included differentiation by task, um, provision of additional uh, sessions for exams, practical arrangements with uh, assessments, for example, give some children extension with assignment deadlines, um, digital opportunities to access content after school, for example, creating a class website where teaching materials can be um, uploaded and children can access them from home. Um, once again, I'd like to remind you that all these practices are what teachers mentioned um, in, in our questions about how all children, especially those on the low side of the attainment gap, can be supported. So these findings point towards three key ideas. The first has to do with the importance of intersectionality. What do I mean by this? I'd like to remind you that uh, at the beginning of um, this presentation, several marginalizing factors were mentioned, like gender identity, sexual orientation, race and ethnicity, competence in language of instruction, disability, social class, and so on things become even more complicated um, when we start considering um, marginalization in intersectional manners. For example, black girls or black girls of low socioeconomic status, immigrant queer children, immigrant queer children with disabilities um, and other possible combinations you can think of Teachers in our study focused almost exclusively on social class, probably as a result of, of the wider uh, discussions at policy level in Scotland. Even those few who mentioned uh, other marginalizing um, factors did not make explicit links between those additional factors and social class. Uh, 
Um, it is very important to understand that almost never these factors play out in isolation. On the contrary, things can be extremely challenging, especially for those children who can be found at the intersections. Uh, and as teachers, we definitely need to develop an awareness of, of these. The second key point is concerned with the extent to which teachers' uh, reported practices are indeed equitable. I'd like to remind you that uh, in our working definition, uh, practices need to be evidence-based and they need to explicitly take pupils' backgrounds into consideration. Yes. Encouraging children to share ideas, teachers direct questioning, the use of concrete materials, the use of technology, and so on, are practices that can be backed up with research evidence about their positive impact on learning. The big question is, however, do these practices take um, pupils' background explicitly into consideration? Here, teachers reported practices, even when they have the best of intentions, they're not linked to, to teachers' main perception about the causes, the causes of marginalization, that is social class. For example, as some secondary teachers uh, reported, um, all teaching materials are uploaded on classroom websites so that children can access them at home. But what about those children who cannot afford devices or having internet at home? Also, the, the, there are so many colleagues in academia arguing that ability grouping is a form of discrimination and, and a practice that reproduces social exclusion and injustices. Equitable teaching uh, presupposes uh, teachers recognizing various marginalizing uh, variables and explicitly employing practices that aim at addressing the causes of marginalization. The third key point uh, regards transitioning from one school level to another, especially when the Scottish government points out that this is very important for children living in, in deprivation. Despite some similarities across school levels or some overlaps between early years and primary and primary secondary, um, practices reported by early year teachers generally stress the social aspect of, of teaching and learning, as for example, play, development of experiences and communication and talk, while practices reported by secondary teachers seem to favor cognitive aspects of learning um, with an emphasis on assessment and examination. It seems that children's experiences as they move from one school level to another, move from exploration, experimentation, and enjoyment of mathematics to exam-centered experiences. I'm closing this presentation with a quote by uh, Alan Bishop, who wrote in one of his papers in 1988, the following, mathematics education in practice is, um, and always should be mediated by human teachers. For this reason, I would like to highlight that uh, what several colleagues in, in mathematics education have already pointed out, that is the importance of teacher education. I'm using the term to refer to both initial teacher education and continuous professional development programs. Mathematics teacher education needs to acknowledge the socio-political dimensions of teaching and learning and explicitly bring issues of marginalization and its intersectional character, equity, equitable teaching practices, inclusion, and social justice into the discussion. So I hope I'm 
uh, within the, the time uh, and I'm at your disposal for questions and, and discussion. So thank you so much. Um, you are absolutely within the time. That's 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 just perfect. Um, okay, so we've we've got a couple of comments and questions in the chat. So Catherine's um, commented about identifying talk of SIMD as talk of social class. Um, Catherine, would you like to open your mic and maybe um, el elaborate on that comment and ask a question? understood it that way when I talked to Scottish teachers I found that they pushed back quite sharply against that language and I was told on by a number of teachers on a number of occasions social class is out of date it's no longer relevant in concept this isn't to do with membership of a group within society it's to do with an individual child's individual deprivation so I wondered did you see anything similar and to understand that sort of gap between what might be your concerns and SIMD and how teachers are actually understanding. No, actually, in in, uh, in in this study, we we uh, we noticed that all participants refer to social class. So it was uh, in a way they, they were uh, reflecting the 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 discourse of of uh, of national uh, of Scottish policies. Um, so they were referring to to SIMDs and, and social class and poverty as the main reason. Um, while, as I said, some of them could sense that there was something else going there uh, other than social class. But they Th those few who were rec recognized or talked about other marginalizing variables did not link them to social class. So it was social class and some few references to other variables. Okay, that's, that's super, thank you. And there's a question from David um, about instances of Teachers of Maths Promoting Equitable Practice. Um, David, would you like to open your microphone and come on? Yeah. Thank you. Um, to just um, mention about equitable practices, uh, you could go back to 2007 and the OECD commented that comprehensive schools in Scotland uh, promoted equity but didn't guarantee it due to practices within schools. And they were talking about uh, setting and just uh, you know, teachers of mathematics, uh, as you, if you've highlighted, uh, would regard ability setting and uh, grouping as a practice that uh, enables them to uh, deliver their curriculum. Were there instances of teachers who engage with equitable practices that takes account of the wide range of intersectionality and organize their classes uh, in order to mix kids, to enable them to relate to each other and make progress with their maths in that way. Um, thank you, David, for, for this. I, I believe it's important for everyone to ask themselves uh, what we mean by equity because it does not seem to be a standard uh, definition out there. Not everyone seems to understand the concept the same way, uh, even um, uh, in academia, in, in practicing teachers in schools, policy makers, and so on. Um, and, and this was not part of um, the findings that I presented today, but uh, as I said, one third research question that we had was um, 
teachers' understandings and perceptions of concepts like equity, inclusion, social justice, and diversity. And to be honest, what I I had in mind or what I uh, I, I expected to to see uh, before uh, collecting and analyzing uh, data was that because the term equity is so prevalent in the Scottish uh, the, the, the discourse of, of Scottish policies, I somehow expected that teachers would feel very comfortable talking about equity. Um, however, what I noticed, uh, and as I said, it's not presented here, um, is that teachers were, or better say, not all teachers were comfortable talking about equity. They could not easily articulate their thoughts about what equity is, what it should look like, what kind of practices uh, re uh, relate to equity. So uh, when, uh, during the interviews, we ask teachers, so what, what, what do you think about equity? Is, is this a term uh, you often uh, discuss or uh, experience as a teacher uh, in relation to school mathematics and numeracy? Um, not many of them could easily um, talk about it. And as I said, it was, th th this was surprising because uh, Scottish policies talk about uh, equity. Um, we have the Pupil Equity Fund, uh, the poverty related attainment gap again, and in relation to equity. Uh, so uh, even though these discussions are out there for many years now, I'm not quite convinced that teachers and policymakers share a common language. Okay, thank, thank, thank you. Um, so there's a comment in the chat just um, from Paul saying, thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Um, Jen's asking where we can access your paper. So maybe we can get a link and pop it into the chat. Um, Jackie, um, would you like to open your microphone and um, you've got a question to ask? Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks very much, first of all, for sharing that work. It's really interesting. I've been doing a bit of thinking, well, a lot of thinking about inclusion, differentiation in numeracy and maths with beginner teachers. Um, and I think that second last concluding point, you know, made me think, what a question that's been rambling around in my head for a long time. Like, how do teachers put their own values into their practices when they see particular practices or even their school's local authorities tell them they have to teach in a certain way? For example, differentiating viability groupings, yet that may not align with their own educational values there. So it's really difficult, I think, at times to break that mold when they have these conflicting messages all the time and I think through my own sort of work a key thing that's came through is the idea of the two dominant um what to say opposing perspectives of inclusion rights respecting and needs based and when you were saying sometimes it's it's when you had this slide with the comments of the teachers sharing different ways they try to provide equity through their teaching through mixed ability versus versus fixed ability groupings it made me think of those two dominating opposing perspectives of inclusion and each of those teachers with the best intention in their heart and their minds is to try and provide that equity so mm -hmm. it's it's yet one perspective may see one practice in a class as in, inclusive and the other perspective may see the same teaching learning task as exclusive so how do we help beginner and in-service teachers as opposed to put their own values into practice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good question. And um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm afraid there is no straightforward answer to these. But what is really, really, really important, I believe, is that everyone needs to understand that um, our own ideologies, our own beliefs and values and socio-political dispositions are there when we teach. So it's, it's, uh, it's a very important starting point. So yes, it, I, I, I would perhaps rephrase your question and say, how can we help teachers um, develop an awareness of this socio-political um, dimensions of, uh, of mathematics teaching and learning? And that's why I strongly believe this should begin as early as possible with initial teacher education. These issues should be explicitly addressed when we talk about numeracy teaching uh, and learning, um, and, and also continuous professional development. Um, they are very, very, very uh, uh, important. Uh, it's very important that programs, again, explicitly um, bring these ideological, sociopolitical aspect of, of mathematics into the discussion, because it's often missing. There, there are so many people who think maths is maths. Uh, it has nothing to do with culture. It has nothing to do with... Um, other societal issues, and um, yeah, and we need to make that explicit. That, that, that's probably uh, a, a good starting point, I believe. Thank you. Okay, so I'm aware we've probably got about three minutes left for questions. Mm -hmm. um, so. I, I don't think we'll get everybody's questions asked. Um, we've we've got a couple a couple of comments. Um, I'm I'm going to come to Jen. Um, Jen, you're asking a question on teachers' own intersectional characteristics. Um, would you like to open your microphone and maybe elaborate a wee bit on on the question? Yeah, I suppose I'm just thinking about in terms of how to support teachers in terms of looking at promoting equitable approaches and um, whether you found that you know if there was when you're talking about um, and pupils were seeing that maybe white males straight males um, do better or have you know the environment for them in the mass classroom that they're doing better whether white male teachers are having a better experience like I, I, don't, I don't know I'm just wondering if you think that a teacher's own characteristics and the way they intersect is impacting or if when we're delivering professional learning for early year staff primary staff and secondary staff yep. whether that is about a, building a teacher self-efficacy as well mm -hmm. before we start to look at how we support the young people it's about supporting the teachers as well yep. I don't know if that makes sense yep 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 um really really important question and um, it's it's something that many teachers around the world, as international uh, literature indicates, when they start developing this uh, a socio-political awareness of uh, how education and how mathematics education, uh, more specifically, um, is uh, framed, let's say, um, they have questions like this. How do I talk about these sociopolitical issues when I am, uh, let's say, I'm, I'm, I'm representing this dominant culture, this dominant group? Um, yep, I, again, um, I, I, I don't have. Um, answers in the form of A, B, C, <laughs> um, but at least being aware of our own positionality, who we are, uh, and how these might have uh, 
put us in a privileged position as we were learning or in, 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 if we have experienced marginalization. Uh, then uh, th th this uh, will more easily be reflected in our teaching. I'm afraid I don't have the answers. Uh, and, and perhaps my presentation is, <laughs> is raising more questions than <laughs> providing answers. And uh, yeah. No, that's great, great provocations. <laughs> great, lots, lots to think about. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, we are almost out of time, so mm. I'm afraid we don't have time for any other questions, but perhaps people that have put questions in the chat, you might want to follow them up via mm. email. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and maybe continue those conversations via Twitter and, and so on. So I will hand over to Lisa, who I think is going to wrap things up for us. Yeah, um, just uh, to say, Diane, before mm -hmm. we go, maybe my email is on this slide. So if anyone has any questions or would like to discuss these uh, more, I'm really happy to. Uh, Brilliant. Thank, thank, yeah. thank, thank, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just before I hand on to Lisa, um, we've already had some emails come into our Inclusive Practice Gmail account asking to join our mailing list. So if you're not on our mailing list or if you're not a member of the network and you'd like to be, this is the plug to send us an email and we can add you we can add you and you can, um, we'll be more than happy to welcome you to the Inclusive Practice community. Um, so Lisa, over to you. Thank you very much, Diane. You did a great job trying to, to get as many questions in. Thank you. And thank you, Pasadena, very much for indeed, as Jen said, provocations. Loads of questions you, you raised here, loads of important questions. And I think what you have done is you've given us a lot to think about and to see how we can um, continue these conversations that we started here in, uh, in our work workplace uh, uh, where we are it's working teacher education other types of, of institutions schools i was very interested to start with um when you talked about the um, uh the the about mathematics education and who who are the winners so to speak who are the ones who, who achieve and you talked about the white middle class boys and I, I found that very interesting um and especially because as you moved on to talk about the um deprivation here in scotland and and how how social class comes into it i suppose as um some of our um participants asked um if class is is part of the issue then where are the girls so that's, uh, you know, when, when if, if we say, OK, it's a class issue and middle class kids are doing better, but but we see here it's middle class boys. So where are the girls? So that's a, that's an important question. I think that we need to to take away and, and think about um, the other point that I found particularly interesting and something for me to follow up is um, you looked at the international literature and you you found that. Um, the context plays an important role in, in where research focuses. So, so and um, in the US uh, race is, is uh, perhaps the, the, the um, influencing factor in, in where researchers are putting their, their efforts and where perhaps they have identified the, the biggest issues. While yes, in the United Kingdom, we talked about um, social class. Uh, in in Europe, it's it's immigration. It's it's children who have the the dominant language as a second language or a a new language to them. So that's again a very important point. So the context uh, plays plays a role there, and um, something that we need to to take a, to take into consideration. I liked your definition of equity. As you said, it's not uh, a term that is easy to, to define, but that 
I like the word eraser, the eraser of the, and of course you talk about math. So yes, I assume the eraser will have to, to come in, eraser, eraser of the ability to predict achievement uh, based solely on, on, on characteristics. So that, that's a very interesting one. Then we, you talked about the, the characteristics of, of equitable education. You talked rather uh, conditions, I suppose, what conditions need to be in place. You talked about access, achievement. Um, you talked about power there, the agency, which is very important. And again, perhaps that takes us back to where are the girls when, when we talk about the middle class boys and, and agency. And, and I think that was reflected in, in um, the comments that we had and the questions around the teachers themselves and, and their own agency. So something again that would need we would need to, to follow up. I liked your nine um, equitable teaching practices. I will not try to uh, summarize them because I wouldn't do them any uh, justice, but it's uh, something I think for all of us to, to go back and uh, revisit. Um, from, from the discussion that we've had, I like this idea of the putting values into practice and, and starting with values. So what are our values as teacher educators, as um, university-based educators, as teachers in schools? We need to look at our values and we can see then how we can put them into, into practice. So, so yes, lots of us, uh, for us to, to think about and um, and follow up I, because we we do not have the time i had a question that uh, i wanted to ask and, and i won't ask it now but I, I just wanted to perhaps put it in the list of things that we need to follow up this idea of the um, mixed ability classes and the this um i suppose practice that we see often the uh, ability ability in the streaming, the, the, the uh, um, arranging classes in mass and perhaps other subjects based on, on ability. I know that the debate over this is still um, pretty, very lively. So, so again, a note for myself. I need to I need to go and and see what's the latest on that debate because it, it is ongoing. So. Yes, you gave us lots to think about, uh, Kostadin, and you raised many important questions. I think the final one, for those of us who I know um, have maths as our specific um, subject or area of expertise, an important question that your presentation uh, raised is, how do these points that you made, how do your findings apply in other subjects and in education more, um, more broadly? So thank you very much. It was um, it was very very um, yeah, thought provoking and, and very interesting to to hear about your study and your findings. We hope that you have a great time in the University of Oslo. We look forward to hearing about perhaps follow up from your research. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Lisa, just to clarify before we go that it's uh, Oslo Metropolitan University. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no worries. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm not um, about the, you, you mentioned the, the idea of erasure. I'm not claiming the, uh, the these terms, the, the, this, this idea belong to Rochelle Gutierrez, who first talked about sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's in your slides, yes. Yeah, 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 I saw it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was a, it's a very interesting one because yeah, yeah. I hadn't come across this idea before, but I liked eraser and I thought eraser mm -hmm. and maths and how we erase, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, what yeah. we, we think is not, um, yeah. is not appropriate. I really like mm -hmm. that. So it's something Great. that I will, I will take away and think about. Great. So thank you, so thank you much. very much. Thank uh, you. I'll pass it over to, to Stella for the conclusion. Yes, thanks a lot. Thanks, Constantinos, uh, for this thought-provoking presentation and everyone for attending this session. I have copied and pasted all the comments so that I can share them with Constantinos at the end. And uh, Constantinos will also perhaps share with us uh, you know, your work, your papers, and we can 
uh, add them to our newsletter so that um, our members can access them. Um, again, you can find uh, all the information about our network on the CIRAS uh, website, and you can also um, check the Twitter account as well. Let us know if you want to be added in our members list, and we hope to uh, see you again at our next uh, event. Thanks everyone, and thanks Diane and Lisa for uh, working with me on this and for monitoring the chat and uh, for the conclusions and discussion. Thank you.